Hello, and welcome to Ancient Jesus Future Faith. I am Tana Schiever, and as usual, I'm joined by Sarah Minardi. Hello. And Don Schiever. Hey. And uh, now that we've gotten our greetings out of the way, we're just going to get right to the topic for this week, which is caring for the poor. This is a topic that is actually mentioned a lot in the Bible. There are over 2,000 references to uh, the poor in some way or another throughout the Bible. Wow. Yeah, (laughs) 2,000. Yet it seems to be a topic that not as many people give, um, I'm going to say serious study to, because I I feel like there are churches that are like, you know, they have these different ministries that care for the poor, and there's sort of like a maybe sometimes like a, a fund or something at their church to help care for the poor or, or whatever. Um, but really diving deep into it, I, I feel like is something that doesn't happen a lot. And part of the reason why I'm saying that is because I, in, in preparation for this episode, I contacted a group of friends and said, you know, what have you been taught about the poor? And the most, most of them responded like not much. Like I just, we never really talked about it that much. So in, in fact, the giving was always kind of framed as giving to the church. Um, you know, if you think a lot of times we, we think that, you know, we talk about the poor, we're talking about giving. Um, so let's start with asking you two what you've been taught about the poor or caring for the poor, what the Bible says about the poor. Um, Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I remember um, being taught that if somebody asks for money that instead of giving them money to try to meet the need. So Mm -hmm. if somebody was asking for gas instead of like giving them or asking for money for gas, instead of giving them money for gas, going to the gas station and filling up their tank or um, as if we can't trust them of with how they're going to spend their money. Right. And then also a lot of we're going to give to the poor or do something for the poor, but we're going to, take our banners so everybody knows we're here. We're going to take our selfies. We're going to post it on social media. If it's not on social media, it didn't happen. Yeah. Like, look (laughs) at us, look at what we're doing. Um, And that there's a side of marketing and promotion along with these acts of caring for the poor. Yeah. Which always feels slimy. Especially since I'm pretty sure the Bible says to do the opposite of that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Don, do you have any uh, any thoughts to add about like what you've been taught before you started, you know, studying your own? You know, I, I think a lot of it was exactly what Sarah said. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of us are are taught to, in some way, take the ability for the person to use the money as they see fit, and take that away from them because we feel in some way that we're a better moral compass than they are. Um, and I think that that's, that's really sad. I think that what, so I don't know that I'm answering your question. I'm probably more so going on my own little kick about this because, you know, <laughs> go for it as, as you both know, I mean, I've spent a lot of my, uh, adult life, uh, working with people in poverty and even to talk about it as what were you taught about the poor it is weird, right? I mean, I understand the wording and the reason we word it that way, but it's really strange as opposed to what have you been taught about your responsibility for those in poverty in your midst? Mm-hmm. Instead, we make it a monolithic group that makes it easier to dehumanize, makes it easier to assume that they're there because of something that due to their fault. And though that may be true on occasion, that is often more so the exception than the rule. So for me, I think it's it's a shame that we've reduced this to how do we as Christians navigate a world that has poor in it? That's what most of us... Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's, that's how most of us either speak about it, think mm-hmm. about it, talk about it, or have heard it taught. And I, so I think that we really need to actually see what the text says. 
because I think the text will not allow us to just feel like we're wading through a creek of poor, uh, but instead that there's something to this idea that we're responsible to and for. That's interesting because I'm kind of thinking about what each of you said, and it it is sort of this, if we're looking at it as like, how do I as a Christian navigate a world that has poor people in it? <laughs> I, if you notice, I didn't even say people. Like, right. because we even, we even dehumanize it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And then to add, you know, in what Sarah said, it's this, um, it is this weird sort of dehumanizing and othering to the point of we police what they do with their money and how we give money. Well, because, because the mindset comes from this idea that they're in that situation because they don't know better. Right. And since I know Some better. Fault of their own. And yeah. since I know better, I'm going to tell them how to use what I give them. Right. Yeah, because forget all the privileges or the life position or support that I have that has led me to be in this position. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And also ignores the fact that we all also medicate and yeah. choose unhealthy things to spend our money on <laughs> because... Yeah. Because we all medicate, we all deal with and cope with things in different ways. And so somehow we imagine that if you are in a situation of abject poverty, that you no longer have the privilege of medicating. And I would argue uh, they, that a person in that situation might have even more reason. Well, and I would say in this, in, by medicating, I believe you mean not just like you know, drinking or no, I mean, binging Netflix. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. That's yeah. like it or eating, things that allowed us to avoid. Or, yeah. Just any, any kind of behavior that allows you to avoid, um, whatever is going on in your life. Yep. And interesting that you say binging Netflix because, um, years ago, um, so this is probably maybe even before Netflix was streaming. Um, uh, I was sitting at a Panera and, the head of a local energy company uh, was giving some kind of press conference and the, the uh, people were asking him like about the rates going up and he answered some questions or whatever. Every, everybody left except for this executive and a couple other people were sitting there eating. And he was like, I don't even feel like I have to apologize for raising the rates because I drive through these neighborhoods all the time and every single one of them has a satellite uh, hookup for, you know, satellite TV or whatever. And he's like, so if they can afford that, then why are they complaining about my prices or whatever? And I just um, remember thinking that was such a like, like, oh, wow, <laughs> this poor family can afford a satellite dish. Well, that's, it's, it. that's what it's called, a satellite dish. It's, yeah. it's yeah. the mindset that says... If you are in abject poverty, that you don't deserve Anything. choice, yeah. you don't deserve uh, entertainment, mm -hmm. you don't deserve a distraction, you don't deserve medicating, like that you just you just need to suffer, right? Like I mean, that's really it what is. we're saying. It's is, yeah. very strange and. And I remember thinking at the time, I I have no idea because um, we we subscribe to streaming services and we don't have satellite, so I have no idea how much satellite costs. But let's say it's a hundred dollars a month, a hundred dollars a month to have constant entertainment in your home is so much cheaper than I mean I know so many people who go out to eat several times a week and then they go to the movies and they go to f football games and they you know like like the, but they can afford it, Tom. I I. I <laughs> <laughs> I get that. But if in my limited budget, what I can afford is this. Right. You know, I mean, I was, yeah. I was being sarcastic. Oh no, I know. I know. It's just, it is just very strange to me to kind of pick on something that in the grand scheme of things is not that expensive and maybe their only luxury. Yeah. Yeah. And a God who creates a world that's so beautiful and full of so many, so much joy and opportunities for pleasure and, encourages that I would say in the text, then why should we judge people for wanting 
to find joy or pleasure in entertainment or simple things right. just because they have a price tag on it. And, and let me put it even more simply. If you're in debt, you also are enjoying things that you don't deserve, quote unquote, That's right. to be enjoying. That's fair. Whether it be a house mm-hmm. that you're in debt for. That's only if you hold that mentality, obviously. I mean, we right, right. we own a house that we have a mortgage on. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying that somewhat in a in tongue-in-cheek in saying that if you are judging someone for having something they enjoy that you perceive they can't afford, then the reality is we're all there. there right. I, don't, I know very few people that hold no debt. And, right. uh, and so we're all enjoying things that we couldn't afford in this exact moment. Yeah. So yeah. maybe we should uh, get into some passages. I was, <laughs> just about, I was just about to say that. Uh, so we've broken down this sort of negative thinking um, around the poor. Um, so air quotes for those of you listening. Yeah. I put (laughs) air quotes around the poor. So let's talk about maybe a few of the passages that for you to helped to either transform your thinking or however you want to look at it. Um, Don, what's, what's a, what's a, I don't know what, what passage I actually want to hear thinking. from, I think, I think I want to hear from Sarah first. Okay. okay. So the immediately what comes to mind is Leviticus 19. Uh, in Leviticus 19, it says, I have it open here. Um, verse nine, when you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You must not strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes, leave them for the poor and the foreign resident I am Yahweh, your God. So this idea that within the Torah, within the Leviticus, within the instructions, God is saying to leave some of your crops so that other people can come and glean and um, get what they need. So you're not gathering every single piece of your crops for your own profit and your own needs, but you're leaving some. You're leaning, leaving a corner that people can come and work. And I think... Um, I love that idea. I love the idea that it was um, it helped protect the dignity of those in need because they were able to work for. It wasn't just leaving stuff out, um, but they were able to go and do work and and gather what they need um, instead of it just being a complete free handout. Um, I just think that that gives some dignity to that um, and that. I just love the idea like that it just existed and people understood that it was a given. So there wasn't, um, it was, it was always there and it wasn't that we had to micromanage it, if that Mm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or, um, so that people would know that the corners of the field after the initial gleaning were left, they could go to it. They could, get what they could do their work. They could get what they need. And, um, yeah. And and an economy like of that time that the crops were the currency. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And in an agrarian society back then, you know, that's how you bartered for things was you traded your crops. Uh, and so you utilized it as, as your, your income. Was yeah. very much your. I mean, your imagine house. like if you have a front porch or a lawn, if you happen to have that, or a stoop, and you're just leaving dollar bills in the corner, and whoever. I mean, it's not the perfect analogy because <laughs> yeah. people aren't, you know, they don't get to do the actual work to get it. But basically, you know, like that was their currency. Yeah. So. Yeah, I also think it's important here that it, it it creates it's two different groups it's for the poor and also for the foreigner hmm. so i think it's it's important that we recognize even within the corners of the field that there's there's dual purposes for this there's uh that it's not just the people in your midst who are struggling uh 
but it's also a person who doesn't have means because they're foreign to your land. And so they don't have, but they need to be able to continue traveling. They need to continue to be able to move. And so Israel was actually behaving in a lot of ways as, you know, free waypoints for people as they were passing through Israel that they could eat and make sure that they, a stranger wasn't going hungry too, I, I think is also beautiful. I think one of the other pieces for me, Sarah, with the corners of the field that I think is is powerful is the visibility of it. And you kind of alluded to it a little bit by saying, if, imagining your front yard, but this idea of like leaving corners of your field, your neighbors could see it, right? Like, so when you decided to harvest your field, uh, I, I think it's important for us to recognize that this passage isn't very clear. Yeah. Right. It doesn't define what is a corner, right? In fact, that's what we're left to wrestle with. So um, how do you think that impacts like a community? If the community sees how you are defining your corners and if it, uh, imagine we're in an agrarian society where people can walk down the street and see your fields. Hmm. Like how does that impact it, do you think? Well, I think it could be inspiring to see somebody leaving a large corner of their field um, inspire me to leave a large corner of my field. It isn't there I don't I don't think it's about giving to the poor, but isn't there a passage that is um, out like outdo one another? It might be in showing grace or something. Showing honor. Showing honor. <laughs> Works. Good old Paul. <laughs> um, and that that's what immediately came to my mind is uh, if it's so public, then maybe there would be more of like a, like a, I don't want to say competition because then that makes it sound bad, but almost like a, well, you know, I'm going to make sure that I do, I give away more. Uh, just because it is more visible. Yeah, I mean, there is a social pressure. Right. Um, that is a positive social pressure. Yeah. Right. Um, Sarah, you mentioned about the idea of of not a free handout. And I mean, I know you and know that you're not against free handouts. You're not against right. giving someone something because they're in need. But I think about that this passage is very different you have Leviticus 19 that says, leave the corners of your field so they can come into the field and and harvest or glean the last remaining pieces of your field. But then we also have Jesus in the Gospels when he says, I was hungry and you fed me, which would be the free handout, mm -hmm. right? That the, mm -hmm. the person actually did nothing other than be hungry to receive something. So can you talk more about how... Uh, the leaving the corner of the field is a is it's not a this isn't an either or that you either right. yeah. you either give a free handout or or you make people work for it quote unquote but yeah if you could go more into that idea of what is the power of leaving the corner for people then to actually engage yeah because I, I think that when we want to meet the needs of those around us. Um, that maybe this is going off in a different direction, but it just reminded me of, a, of this idea that we don't always know what people need and um, that sometimes we meet needs in the way we think they need to be met instead of actually listening um, or opening up the door for conversation of what the person actually needs. And if we open up the door for that conversation and listen to what they need, and honor that, then we're honoring that person and we're giving them more dignity. And um, in in the way of the corners of the field, being there that they can come and, and take what they need. Yeah, so it's just a slightly different nuance, but the working, the idea that they could work for it, to me, suggests that we're um, respecting their dignity. And um, when we have somebody in our own lives who we know they're struggling. Um, sometimes that all we, sometimes we don't have the information to know what they most need, in which case, yes, drop off a meal, do whatever you can, um, whatever you think. And I'm not saying that those things are, um, 
it's again, it's like the both, like do those things that you think that they, that they might appreciate, but the greater gift often is if we can actually find out what their needs are and meeting them with those actual needs. So even if they're out of work, trying to help like create that system for them to be able to work, you know, like the saying, um, you can't teach it or what is it? The fish thing, like instead of giving them a fish, teach them how to fish. Well, do both, like give them the fish right? so that they're fed and their needs are met so that they are equipped and then help them navigate the system to be able to learn how to fish and, and get more fish. Right. right. So it's, it, to me, it's really both that yeah. we meet immediate needs without judgment. Um, and we help build, we help influence systems and we help meet, um, needs and requests that, that they have and providing that listening ear even because what they actually need might be very different than what we assume that they need. Yeah. I, uh, I think that sometimes we also then, if we looking at the corners of the field and thinking about the idea that let people, uh, give people the opportunity to, you know, take what they actually need from the field, uh, and, you know, provide for their family in that way. I think sometimes we confuse that piece with having people jump through hoops mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, meet a certain standard to then be considered worthy to uh, receive. And I think it's really important for us to make sure that we are not confusing these things. The thing that makes someone worthy to receive their basic needs is hunger. Right, right. right. There, nothing else. Not a W-2. Jesus doesn't ask for ID or tell us to ask for ID or check to see if they've been to other food pantries in the area. Like none of that. It's just hunger is it. Nakedness is it. You clothe, you feed. Um, not even ask why they're in prison, but go visit, right? So these are pretty stunning pieces. I think sometimes we've confused uh, this idea of creating a space in which people can maintain their dignity by uh, working or contributing to something in order to gain something for their home or for their household with having them jump through hoops. And jumping through hoops is actually the opposite of giving dignity. It's dehumanizing a person. And I think that we as, as members of the faithful would do well to examine what our motivations are when we insist on people jumping through hoops in order to be considered worthy of being fed. Right. Let's like, let's break down the hoops. Let's break down the barriers. You yep. know, it's great to have a food pantry, but can people physically get to your pantry? Right. Um, and I think part of that would be in the planning of these things is including the voices of the people that you're trying to help. Because we can sit um, and imagine again what we think is best, yep. and we don't have we don't always have that experience. But getting input from the people, listening to what actually would help, and yeah, not setting up unnecessary hoops. Like there was this library program, there was this feeding kids program that used to be like you would go to the library and pick up food and take it home. And because I go to the library very often with my girls, I would see them there at certain times. And then suddenly a few months ago, they shifted it. And instead of being like outside the library with their food to take home, it's inside the library and you have to eat it there. Yeah. And it just was so puzzling to me. And I'm not a part of that organization or a part of the planning, but it made me sad because if, if people are hungry and they need food to eat, like at least let them decide when to eat it. Yeah. And they might not be hungry right now. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I have a hard time understanding the motivation besides control of wanting to control it or thinking that, that we know best or not. I don't know. I mean, not wanting to be taken advantage. Not, of. Yeah. And it was, it just very puzzling to me why that choice was made that now, we're going to still offer the food, but you have to eat it here. 
Well, I I think that's unfortunately an attitude that, um, or this desire for control, um, is very common, uh, in honestly, in a lot of people who do serve the poor. Uh, I remember when um, I was the executive director of Food for Thought, a a local um, food need um, uh, distribution nonprofit. Yeah, here in Toledo. That was really bad. (laughs) Thank goodness I'm not representing them anymore because I'm not doing it well. Um, We had a food pantry and uh, we had we were very, very well. First of all, we were very unique in that. we offered a choice to people. So we had it set up kind of like a mini grocery store Mm -hmm. and people could go around and pick like which vegetables they wanted and which things, you know, um, and not just get a box of things that they might not like, or they might not be able to eat because maybe there's three cake mixes in there and they're diabetic or whatever. Yeah. And we were very fortunate at one point to have fresh fruits and veggies. And, um, but you know, there were times when depending on how they when they got there and which days we were open or whatever, things would start to rot. And so we would ask the volunteers to remove the rotting vegetables. And I had a volunteer who refused and she said, they're, they're poor. They should just be grateful for anything they get. And I just remember thinking, wow, that really like that's, you know, and it is this weird measure of control because we also, you know, we were a part of a network of food pantries and there were different people at different food pantries who were very much like, did they go to yours? Did they, you know, did they come to mine? Like how many, like, it was almost like they were trying to like figure out if people were gaming the system and going to too many food pantries and getting too much food, Yeah, (laughs) which is such a ridiculous thought if you think about it. Yeah. It's, it's very strange. Well, and then we, we uh, couch it in being good stewards. Yeah. Right. Which is, right. which is devastating, right? Yeah. So with what I want to think about a little bit more is this corners of the field picture because you literally could just leave one piece of vegetation in each corner. Mm-hmm. Um, I doubt they were square plots in ancient times. So there was probably way more than just four corners. Uh, and, or you could really just take nothing or just one vegetable out of the center and leave the rest. And I think that there's something really powerful, one, about the fact that most of God's commands in the text are really this wide open. Mm-hmm. Like they're really left for you. God would look down upon your field, and if you only had a piece of vegeta- vegetable or a stock of whatever in each corner, God would say, well done, good and faithful servant. If you only took a little bit out of the middle and left the huge field, God would say, well done, good and faithful servant. Our neighbors might say something different about us mm-hmm. um, on that case. But I think there's something really valuable to recognize God genuinely created a system that allows us to express our generosity freely. And in so doing, if everyone were to express their generosity in a, in a healthy manner, there really would be a, a, a mechanism in place that there would be very little hunger in your community, mm. um, people would be able to access food. And to think about it in terms, like you were saying, Sarah, that that uh, food was the currency also is really powerful right. to think that you are leaving currency just sit out there and someone could come into your field and without anything other than they were in need, they could gather as much of this currency as they could carry as they could spend time doing and it would benefit their household without it being a moral compass of so how are you going to use all that corn right are you gonna are you gonna just turn around and sell it because that used to be one of my favorite things is when we we would distribute bicycles and people would say aren't you worried that they're just going to go sell the bike and i'm like no that'd be amazing if they went and sold the bike and people were like what do you mean it'd be amazing like you just gave them a bike and they're going to turn out and it's like, well, no, we're creating an economy. 
that's wonderful because maybe that person didn't need the bike, but they were willing to sign up for it. They were willing to wait for however long it took for them to get the bike. Then they lined up a customer for themselves. They sold the bike to, for a price that the customer thought was fair, they thought was fair, and then they were able to take that bicycle, turn it into currency, and actually buy something then that they needed. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. But I think it's really hard sometimes for us to get past this idea that we're not giving away currency. We're giving away something that is dictates how you must use it, mm -hmm. what your need must be, and what you're going to do with it. And this Leviticus passage doesn't do that. Yeah, It really just allows people who are in desperate situations, if they want to go to every single field in the community, they can. Mm. And that's good because then maybe they'll be able to buy back their land and maybe then they'll be able to break free from some of the debt that they had or incurred. Mm. Uh, and it's powerful. Yeah. But we almost are afraid that today that people in poverty will take advantage of our systems in order to bring about wealth to their household. <laughs> and But that's exactly what the text is trying to do, yeah. is try to create this scenario. Why do you think that is? Like, why, why don't we celebrate the poor when they are getting resources or celebrate advancement what do you think it is about our lens or our society that doesn't want to see that happen? I think it's the individualism, mm. right? That we no longer value it takes a village. Yeah. We yeah. no longer value that your well-being is something that I'm interested in. In fact, actually, this just leads me to my passage. So we, we've been talking about your passage. Now it's time to talk about mine, yeah. Sarah. All right. <laughs> that was my intent. All right. So let's let's take a look <laughs> here. Um, so my passage is Deuteronomy 15. And so I'm going to begin in verse 4. And it says, However, there be, need be no poor people among you. That's a really awkward sentence to start with. But basically, there doesn't need to be any poor in your midst. For in the land of the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, God will richly bless you. If, and this is the part, you, well, I think we'd like to stop at the end of verse 4, right? Because we're like, okay, God's going to bless us, right? But there's, a, there's an if. It, let's start verse 5. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. Right? So God's saying there won't be any poor amongst you if you do everything I've commanded you. And it says, for the Lord your God will bless you as, as has been promised, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Verse 7, if anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. We don't like this passage. This passage is rough for us, right? Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. So I'm going to stop there for a moment because I do want to read verse 11 because I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. But this passage basically is God saying, I'm going to give you commands, and if you live out the way I've asked you to live, it will defeat poverty. And really in the Hebrew, um, at least what was taught to me at one point about this, the word poor here is people are in chaos. Mm. That it's not just financial poverty. It's just that they are dependent upon other things for their sustaining, uh, to be sustained. And because of that, they're experiencing chaos, right? So in this 
passage, though, God says, if you meet someone who is in chaos, who is in poverty, give generously to them. And why, you may ask, am I supposed to give generously to them? Well, it's because God just told you that there won't be any poor if you do everything I've commanded. And so because you meet someone poor implies you have not done everything that was commanded. And the you is plural, referring to Israel. But here's the thing that's different, and this goes to what you were asking, Sarah. As individuals in in a Western culture, we think what is mine is mine and what is yours is yours. That is not how it was thought of in ancient Israel. Instead, it was thought, what is mine is yours and what is yours is yours. Right? That was a saintly way of thinking. Um. And because of that, if everyone lived that way, there, there isn't room for poverty. There's not room for chaos because everyone is freely giving to everyone to ensure the well-being of everyone. And then God ends with this really sad line in verse 11. It says, there will always be poor people in the land. Mm. Right? This is this is devastating statement. God says, if you do everything I command you, there will be no poor in the land, right? That's what literally verse four says. Mm -hmm. And and it ends with, but the poor will always be with you, which is what Jesus is quoting when the apostles are like, why'd you waste all of that perfume and why didn't we sell it and give it to the poor? And Jesus looks at them and is like, you know, the poor are always going to be with you. And it is a slap in the face mm. to the apostles. Because he's implying you, plural, us, plural, have not lived the way God's commanded us. Mm-hmm. And so we will always have the poor amongst us because we are not behaving the way God has called us to behave. And I would argue Jesus is, is saying what is happening right now is following the commands of God. What the woman did in that moment was part of the commands of God. And so to judge her was to actually miss the entire point. Yeah. Right. So this passage is why, uh, or this passage addresses the why of your question, um, that what is it about us that we want to, we don't take delight in other people moving from poverty to affluence or moving out of poverty. And I think a lot of it is because we have this mindset is you made your bed, now you lie in it. Mm -hmm. And if I take stuff that I earned Mm -hmm. and you think you have a right to it, Mm -hmm. that's no. And so let me me say real quick, uh, there's a rabbinic uh, concept that says there are a handful of different types of people. Right. The first one is the person that says, what is mine is yours and what is yours is mine. And that's a fool. Right. Then they say, um, I already referenced the saint. Right. What is mine is yours and what is yours is yours. That's the saint. Then they say the wicked person is the one that says, what is mine is mine and what is yours is mine. And that is a wicked person. Then there's the fourth one. And I mentioned it earlier. And it's the sodomite as they reference it, because Ezekiel 16, 9 says the sin of the city of Sodom was that they were wealthy and affluent, but did not care for the poor. So I mentioned it. Do either, did either of you catch what the fourth type of person is? So we have, go ahead. What is mine and mine is what is yours. What is, what is mine is mine and what is yours is yours. Yes. So the fourth type of person is the one that says, what is mine is mine and what is yours is yours. And that's the you made your bed, you lay in it type thing, right? Mm. And that is considered a sodomite. And God wipes the sodomites off the earth because God imagines that to be one of the most wicked, horrible ways to function in this world is to not, to have affluence, to have means, to have access and not redistribute. And what was the what was the Ezekiel verse about? Sixteen nine. Ezekiel sixteen nine says, "This is the sin of your this is the sin of your sister city Sodom, 
wow, say that like five times. <laughs> they were affluent, but did not even share bread with the poor, something to that effect. Got it. And that's so significant and way different than the way, uh, you know, right. uh, that story of, of uh, Sodom gets told. Right. Um, and that story of this uh, sin in, equal, in Ezekiel 16.9 does not mention uh, anything that is usually the way that that passage is taught. Right, right. So I do think that this is why we struggle. We live in an individualistic society. Um, we don't live in a society. In fact, all you have to do is turn on the radio to hear people calling people socialists. Um, and I would argue they need to understand, they need a better definition of socialism because what's being argued for in the U S is not socialism right. in most cases, right. but this idea of, of redistributing, um, as being somehow antithetical to the, what God has called us is to miss the fact that it's exactly what God has called us to. You have something and they don't have something mm -hmm. and you're going to keep it instead of helping them. The text actually, I want to say somewhere in Malachi, I would love for someone that's listening to, to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, basically says, if you have two coats and your neighbor has none mm -hmm. and you go to sleep and don't provide them a coat, you have stolen from them. Mm -hmm. That is, it, that's mine. That's mind shattering. It, it's funny that you say that because that's immediately what popped into my head was the two coats thing. Um, and this is such a, this feels like such a minor thing um, based on sort of the heaviness of what we're talking about. But um, I've been on this cleaning kick and this like getting rid of things kick. And unfortunately it was only because of this desire to clear out my house and not a desire to give to others that I finally cleaned out my closet. And I had been holding on to all of these clothes with honestly, with the hopes that I would lose weight and fit back into them. Mm -hmm. And I had multiple sizes in there and, 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 but I was just holding on to them like, well, I might lose weight and I might need them. And then finally at one point, you know, be partially because of this cleaning kick and also partially because I'm trying to feel better about myself, no matter what size I am. Uh, I was like, I need to let go of these clothes. And, um, I gave, I took the, I had them all in bags. And then, um, I remember that a friend of mine had, uh, we were, we were like a similar size and she had just lost a whole bunch of weight. And I thought maybe she needs these. And I took them to her and she was just so excited. She was like, you know, like I can't really afford to go out and replace my whole wardrobe. And then I just constantly saw pictures of her like posting herself on, on Facebook and Instagram, like in these different outfits that were mine, you know, and it gave me so much joy. And I just thought like, why was I holding on to that? And I realized like, that's like a really minor thing in the, in the grand scheme of, you know, giving, giving things, uh, to others and, and everything. But that, that, that little, like, that kind of small example of that helped kind of bring that home to me of like, why do I hold on to extras of things that I don't need when other people could use them? Yeah. And I would encourage you not to diminish that. I mean, I, I understand you're saying in comparison to someone in abject poverty and making sure that they're able to eat, eat right? Yeah. is one thing. But I, I wouldn't, I'd be careful for us to not celebrate. I'd be careful of us not not celebrating. I don't know. I'm so confused now with all my <laughs> double what negatives. What do you want us to celebrate? <laughs> I just, just stop celebrating. Okay. Everyone just be miserable. No, I, I think that we need to be able to celebrate. How's that? There you um, go. everything that we do that has us bent towards God. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That we shouldn't be, we shouldn't say, Oh, well I could have X, Y, Z. Yes, that's fair. But, if what you're doing has you bent towards God, that's worth celebrating, and that's a good thing. And we should we should try not to d diminish that in ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Similar. I have a similar story, but about baby clothes. Like I was holding on to clothes after Abby of different sizes, you know, hoping that we would become pregnant again. And after years, like going into the boxes of the clothes, realizing that 
And I never packed up anything that had a stain on it because I figured, you know, if I donate this, I don't want it to have be the stained or the tattered things. I, everything I packed up was in good condition enough to be used again. And going through the clothes um, after they were just like sitting there and realizing that like probably just the passage of time, I don't know the science behind this, but like some of the things when I would go to get them to give to somebody else and stains would have come out. So I think like maybe stains like get washed in the wash, but then over time they can reappear. We'll go with that. It, it, just, it just made me think, you know, like um, storing things away where moth and rust can destroy. Like, mm. is that the verse? Um but yeah, like just say doth at some point. <laughs> in, 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 yeah. But yeah, like, you know, I was holding on to these things and they were just deteriorating in my attic right, loft. Right. And when other somebody could have actually been using them in real time and odds are that if I got pregnant again, we'd be able to provide enough clothing for that child. And then there came like a big collection for I think it was like for refugees at the border several years ago. And I just like let go of it all. And it, you know, then it turned out, then we got pregnant and sure <laughs> enough, like enough clothes showed up to, right. to clothe yeah. our daughter. And, um, yeah. So sometimes we're like, and, and I know, like, I think the scarcity mindset or, you know, having grown up, not having a lot, um, that I want to hold on to things. Cause I think it's like going to, help us if I hold on to it and we don't have to spend money on it again in the future, but I'm missing so much time passing when somebody could have been blessed by these things. Well, and I think that both mindsets that we were just talking about is a, is a, uh, a result of that individualistic mindset we have, particularly in this country, um, of I might need it again. Yeah. I'm not using it right now, but I might need it again. And I was thinking about too about this. Um, I do that with cables. Yes, you do. <laughs> There's so many cables. You never know. <laughs> um, the Deuteronomy 15, uh, when you were talking about the corporateness of this first done, and mm -hmm. you were talking about how you know um, if if you follow all of the Lord's commandments, there will be no poor among you, and about how that was like a corporate message. And, and I wonder if because we do have this individualistic lens, if when many of us read the Bible and we read that verse, you know, it's almost like the, the mind could twist it and make it, well, if you followed the Lord's commandments, you wouldn't be poor. Absolutely. And I have been following the Lord's commands, and therefore I'm not the one that should be giving. Mm -hmm. Ah, mm. Oh, right. So it's not... It's, it's not, not my fault. Right. It, I've been doing. It was, it was yeah. Frank over there that <laughs> wasn't Frank. Yeah. Let's just be <laughs> Frank. Um, so I, I think, you know, that also then goes into the second half of Deuteronomy 1511. I stopped after I said, therefore the poor will always be with you. That verse continues mm. because God says doing everything I've commanded you today. And then I love that he throws this, he sneaks this last, God sneaks this last command in saying, therefore, I command you to be open-handed mm -hmm. toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. And this idea of open-handed li would literally mean no strings attached. Mm. I'm not holding on to anything. I, I have my hands open and you can take whatever you need from my open hands and you can take it. And... Again, I think we do this whole thing where we play moral compass. We make people jump through hoops. We do all this stuff that uh, somehow does not allow us to take ownership in the systems that are in place in our communities that have generationally harmed folks. Mm. And I would argue that if if we all took responsibility for that and genuinely looked at the systems that are harmful and said, uh, not only am I responsible for it, but I'm responsible to do something about it, as you mentioned earlier, Sarah. Like, I'm not, I'm not free to not worry about the systems because they don't impact me. I'm, I'm now commanded to bring down the systems that have systematically or historically 
harmed people, mm. that I'm to be active in that. And if I'm not going to be active in that, or if all of the others amongst me, amongst us that are faithful are not actively doing that, then I better have open hands with any of the needy and poor in my community. And I just think we have way underestimated what the Bible commands us hmm. about those in need. Wow. I don't know why this is in my head, but I remember once um, you us talking in our church community about priest versus prophet and how so many of us want to live as prophets where we're telling people what to do mm. <laughs> as opposed to priests, which were um, interceding for the needs of the people yeah. and probably meeting the needs of the people because the priests would have followed the Torah. Yep. Um, but it just, that comparison came to mind that like, um, if we kind of relate to prophet to telling people what to do or stretch it a little bit to be like judging people that we like, that's what we think our job is to yes. judge people um, and mm. make those decisions. And as opposed to being, um, but I think that the passage that we were studying that day called us to be priests. Yes. There's a few places that says you are to be the priesthood to all nations. There right. is no passage that says you are to, to be, be the prophets to all nations. <laughs> yeah. You so, being plural. Interceding in prayer, interceding in worship, but interceding also by me just meeting the needs and not passing judgment or telling people what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to kind of make that a little bit more uh, clear, in, in Hebrew mindset, the priest's job was to stand before God on behalf of the people, right? Uh, not even how we do it as pastors who tend to stand between the people and God, but preach at the people. Uh, the priest role was literally to to stand on behalf of Israel or the faithful in front of God, and that's what we're called to do for people, and that's that's powerful. Wow, I love all of this, <laughs> um, and I think that is a great place for us to wrap up today. Maybe. Maybe. Oh. Can I throw I'm one just, more? Just kidding. Throw a wrench in this. Okay. How do we receive this teaching without it being filled with shame and guilt? That is an excellent question. Because I also believe that what God has commanded us is something that brings freedom to us, does not fill us with shame and guilt. But I think because we are individualistic mm -hmm. in our upbringings and we're trying to understand a faith that is corporate, that it oftentimes, that bridge is filled with shame and guilt. And so I'm just curious before we wrap up how we can encourage either each other sitting around this table or our audience to take on this teaching but not take it on as shame because maybe you haven't done this yet or you're, you struggle with the, some of these ideas. How do we do this well? Yeah, because I think it becomes difficult um, because when it comes to like spending our own money, like are we supposed to give every single thing that we have and not... Um, indulge in pleasures or things like that? Do we need to feel shame or guilt if we're spending money on ourselves or um, even though we might celebrate like somebody else, like finding joy. And um, if we get to that point of celebrating somebody else, finding joy, it can still be hard to like do that for yep. yourself. It's um, last night I was talking to my daughter. She was upset because her grandma was leaving to go out of town and it kind of led to some other things coming up that she feels um, like she wants to cry when everybody tell somebody tells her that she hasn't done the right thing. And I, I was sad with her, but, but I'm like, well, I, I feel that a lot too. And I asked her as, you know, do you, you know, is it okay for people to make mistakes? And she said, yeah. And I said, well then, or if I think first I asked her, is it okay to make mistakes? And she's like, I don't know. And 
is it okay for other people to make mistakes? Yeah. Like a very quick, like, yeah, she was able to see that other people can make mistakes. Hmm. And then, well, are, is it okay for you to make mistakes? And again, back to the like, oh, I don't know. And it's like, just sometimes we hold ourselves to like such a higher standard um, than we do for other people that, you know, I could, I can show grace and mercy to other people, but I can't for myself. So it just relates to me that like, you know, with the shame piece of, um, not carrying more shame or guilt for myself for taking care of myself because I have to take care of myself because taking care of myself helps me to care and love other people. Absolutely. And I would take it one step further of something I've been reflecting on recently that like, um, when I see uh, people I care about taking care of themselves, either because they have medical issues or, um, any, really anything, like it makes me so happy to see people I care about taking care of themselves in a way that pretty much they only can, whether it's like, um, taking their medication or taking a supplement or exercising, because when people I love take care of myself, take care of themselves, it's like, I'm just, I'm so happy that they're, they're doing the things that only they can do. Um, I'm celebrating that. So that needs to be able to be flipped for me. And I need to celebrate and prioritize doing the things I need to do to take care of myself so I can love other people well yeah. and not feel shame for um, wasting money or um, um, or time or things like that That in, in, in doing that. That reminds me of when... Um in the early, early days before, um, food for thought was officially founded. Um, the, uh, the non local nonprofit that Don, um, founded here. Um, we were having this conversation with a group of people who are very interested in, in getting that work started. And, um, and Don had talked about, it might've been the corners of the field passage. Yeah. And somebody was like, can I still get pedicures? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, I, I need to know. And Don refused to answer. And she was so like, he's like, that's a decision for you to make. And she's just like, she wanted him to like either say, no, you can't or give her permission yeah, I don't think to she, get pedicures. I don't know that she necessarily cared which answer I gave. She, she just, just wanted an answer. She just wanted an answer. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so I think what you were saying is, is, is interesting because there's also like, there is a self-care, um, aspect of that. Um, and so I think it's a balance of, you know, um, cause I think some people might, might hear this message and go away with, oh, I can't ever do anything for myself. I can't, you know, ever, I have to give away everything and, 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 and almost be despondent about it. And I don't think that's the answer, but I yeah, also, you'll have to wait till we talk about the rich young ruler. Today. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what was going through my mind. But I also think we um, are obligated to do something. And um, one of the, the thing that popped into my head, and I did a quick Google search here for it, is this um, quote that the internet is telling me actually comes from the Talmud. Um, which is do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now love nurse, love mercy. Now yeah. walk humbly. Now you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Rabbi Tarfon or Tarfon. There you go. Um, so I was really, I was really thrilled when I did this quick little Google search. I was like, Oh, it's from the town. Moon. <laughs> nice. Um, hey Tana, did you know that that's, uh, my tagline on my emails? Yes, I am aware. Okay. That's I was why, like, that's why I was like, I was like, Tana never reads my emails. No, that's, that's why it was in my mind. Cause it's always, okay. I, I see it often. Um, and I love this quote because it's, it doesn't leave you off the hook. You right. know, it says you're not free to abandon the work. But it also tells you not to be daunted by the enormity of yes. Work. So you giving away baby clothes and me giving away my clothes and any any small. I'm thing, not giving away my cords. <laughs> any small any small gestures we make help contribute to the greater good. So let me let me say this. Maybe this is a good way to close. Um, I'll let you determine that. Uh, <laughs> the rabbis had this phrase, and Jesus used it often. And the phrase is how much more. Mm. 
And it's always used in a situation where you say, I gave this, or I did this, or I needed this. And then it would follow up. And how much more if we exceeded that, right? Yeah. And I would say for us, we can look at our life and say, I have experienced being generous and receiving generosity. How much more when I'm more intentional about it? Mm -hmm. um, how much more will I experience God? How much more will I experience community? How much more will I experience my neighbor uh, if I, I step it up? And to uh, Rabbi, the Rabbi that you mentioned from the Talmud, and it's not that you're responsible to complete it, but you're just responsible to take a step, one degree, one, one iota, right? Just one bit more. And if that becomes our goal, right, uh, of just taking one additional step each day, how much more, how much further will we go? How much more will we experience God's goodness and God's generosity? So to everyone, I just want to say how much more. How much more? Wonderful. I love it. So I was right. That is a good way to close. That is mm -hmm. a good way to close. Sweet. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Um, in between episodes, you can catch us on Twitch on Mondays and Thursdays uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can find us at our website, ancientjesusfuturefaith.com. Uh, email us at info at ancientjesusfuturefaith.com or find us on social. And uh, I think that's it. We'll see you next time. Bye. See ya.